Good evening, everyone, and welcome to A Word from the Word. I'm Brother Don, here to share with you tonight from the Word of God. And if you have your, your Bible, if you want to open to Revelation chapter 12, the book of Revelation and chapter 12, and I want to talk about uh, a couple of very interesting things we find here in Revelation chapter 12. And let's ask the Lord to be with us tonight and to guide us as we study Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you, Father, that you speak to us through your word and that your Holy Spirit, Lord, teaches us and guides us by the very words of this book. And Lord, we know that it is inspired by you. It is your word, and Father, help us to receive it as such. And Lord, help us to learn and to grow tonight and that our lives would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as I said, Revelation chapter 12, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter because I want to focus on just a verse in particular, but you need to see the chapter to get the, the context and the setting of the verse. And Revelation chapter 12 is actually a, a parenthesis, if you would, in the narrative of the book of Revelation. And it teaches us some things that happened in the past and some things that are going to happen in the future. And I guess maybe the, the, the main topic or one of the main topics of, of this chapter is Satan's hatred for and persecuting of the people of Israel. And this is nothing new. I mean, Satan and the world, because the world is in Satan's control, has hated Israel and has persecuted Israel since, since the beginning of, of Israel's history. And the reason that Satan hates Israel so much and wants to destroy Israel is because it is through Israel that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would come. And Satan knows that if he can destroy Israel, he can stop the Messiah. So that's what he tries to do. And verses 1 through 3 describe that. They talk about how Satan came against Israel and, and tries to stop the birth of the Messiah. But then in verse 5, it says these beautiful words, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. So Satan didn't stop the Messiah. But we're going to see here in just a minute that he's still trying to do that. But as you see also in verses 5 and 6, that he goes on and he talks about, he says that she gave birth to a son who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So you see things in these two verses that these two verses are tied together in the context, but you see things that are separated by at least 2,000 years because she gave birth to a son and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Well, that happened almost 2,000 years ago. Jesus' birth, his death, resurrection, and then his ascension to heaven. But then the rest of what this verse talks about is all future. It's even future for us. It hasn't happened yet. He will rule the nation with an iron, the nations with an iron scepter. That'll be during the millennial reign of Christ. And then the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And that 1,260 days, which is three and a half years, is future. And it's in the tribulation period. And in particular, the last half of the tribulation period. So you see that those two verses are separate, or those verses contain things, part that happened 2,000 years ago and part that will still happen. And then in verses 7 through the end of the chapter, it describes to us a war that is going on in heaven and will intensify in the future, especially in the last days of the tribulation. And that war is going on right now, and it will continue, but it is Satan and he is defeated in heaven, and then he is barred from heaven, and he comes to earth. I think in a physical manner, or at least in the form of the Antichrist. Now, you can read the chapter. I'm not going to read it all. You can read the chapter 
and, and see this war described how Satan fought against Michael and his angels and he lost and there was no place for him. And so he's kicked out of heaven, thrown down to earth. And while he's on earth, he elevates his persecution against Israel. He just, in the scripture, this is where we get that phrase. If you look at verse 12, it says, because he knows his time is short. He is filled with fury. So he intensifies or he elevates his persecution of Israel, attempting to destroy Israel, this during the tribulation period, because he knows his time is short. But he also knows, and the reason why he's so hard against Israel and wants to destroy them in the tribulation period is because if he can destroy Israel, then there's no reason for the Messiah to come back. Now, I'm going to talk about this in another study. I'm going to talk about the, the purpose of the tribulation period. And the purpose of the tribulation, just real quick, is to deal with Israel. It has nothing to do with the church. And really, it doesn't have that much to do with the world. The world is a player in it, but only as it relates to Israel. The purpose is to deal with Israel and for Israel to finally come to a point where they turn to their Messiah. And Satan knows that if he can destroy Israel, that there'll be no reason for the Messiah to come back. That was the purpose of the Holocaust. That was why Satan moved Hitler to try to destroy the Jews because World War II and then what happened right after that, 1948, Israel became a nation. Satan knew that if he could stop Israel from becoming a nation, if there is no Israel, there's nothing for the Messiah to come back for at the end of the tribulation period. So that's why Satan hates Israel so much. And that's why Satan tries to destroy Israel. And then in verses 13 through 16, the scriptures here tell us that the woman who is Israel is hidden in the desert somewhere and is protected by God. So Satan, the Antichrist, can't get to Israel because God himself protects her. And that ought to be a great comfort to you and me today. It, and as we've talked about in several of these studies, it, it looks like that the church is losing. It looks like that, that Christians and Christianity are losing, but they're not. And even in the tribulation period, when it looks like Israel is about to be destroyed, wiped off the face of the earth, God protects them. And so God, in the same way, is going to take care of his church, of his people here on earth. And no matter how bad it looks for us, and no matter how bad it gets on us, we have the confidence that God is protecting us and God is watching over us to fulfill his plan. But the woman is hidden from Israel, is hidden in the desert and taken care of so that Satan can't get to her. And now notice verse 17 of the chapter. It's the last verse in chapter 12, verse 17. It says, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Now, remember, he can't get to her because God's protecting her in the desert or in the wilderness. And so Satan goes off to make war against her offspring. Now, listen to the description and notice that it says the rest of her offspring. And listen to the description that it gives of her offspring. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, that describes those people in that day of the tribulation period when this is actually talking about. But that also describes you and me today, those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. It describes us. And so we find ourselves in the same situation that these people are. Satan is furious. He can't destroy God. He can't destroy Israel. And so he's going to come after the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's us, church. That's you and me. Satan is after us. These people in Revelation chapter 12, during the tribulation period, the scripture says they overcome Satan. And that's what I want to look at tonight, because we are under the exact same attack 
that they are. We are facing the same enemy that they are going to be facing. We are fighting the same war that they are that they're going to be fighting, and they are going to overcome Satan, and so can we. And verse eleven tells us how we do it. This is a familiar verse. I know you've heard this before. Verse 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That's, that's powerful. That, if there is a formula for victory in scripture, that's it. And that's what I want to look at tonight. How did they overcome Satan? How will they overcome Satan in the tribulation period? And folks, this is the way that, that God's people have overcome Satan since God's people started. This is how it was done. And this is how we will do it today. Number one, they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. This means the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what this means. He's talking about he is the lamb of God that shed his blood for his people. His death was for us. His death was in our place. His death was for our sins, a debt that we couldn't pay. And as Paul said, his death, Jesus Christ's death, was so that we could be saved and share in his resurrection. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, he says, I want you to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of, suffer, of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's why Jesus died in our place, paying for our sins so that we could share in his resurrection and eternal life. And so first of all, when dealing with the blood of the lamb and knowing that that's how they overcame Satan, first of all, you need to know that you're saved. You need to know that, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that you have repented of your sins and come to him. And without coming to Jesus in faith, there is no salvation. And so first of all, you need to know that you were saved. But second of all, you need to know and to understand how you got saved. This is, this is so important, and I'm going to touch on this some more in just a minute, but, but in particular, what you need to understand is that you got saved by a work of God in you, in your life. Now, get that. You got saved by a work of God in your life through faith and not of anything that you did. What we did was we simply responded to God. And we need to understand that without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. And so when God begins to deal with us and begins to draw us to himself, what he does is he reveals to us that we are sinners and that we need a savior and that he provided a savior in his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. And then he does a work as John chapter three and verse six John chapter 3, the whole describes the work that God does in our hearts and in our lives. It is only by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are saved. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You see, it's nothing that we did. It's nothing that we could do. It's by the blood of the lamb. Do you know that today? Do you understand that your salvation is a work of God apart from you? And that it, it is something that God gives to you, brings to you as a gift of grace? And what that brings us to is that Jesus has already defeated Satan. And so our salvation, our victory in this world, our overcoming Satan is already a settled matter. 
Now, that's important, and you're going to see it in salvation in just a minute when, when I touch on it again and talk about something. But Jesus has already defeated Satan. That's why he's so angry. He's been kicked out of heaven. He knows he's defeated. He knows he only has a short time. And so his, his anger, his fury is just boiling over. And our victory is not in, in us. It's not in how strong we can be or how great we are or anything like that. Our victory is in the simple fact of Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again, therefore defeating Satan. Our victory is the blood of the Lamb just like our salvation is. And then secondly, he says that they overcame him not only by the blood of the lamb, but he says, and by the word of their testimony. They overcame him by the word of their testimony. Now, that word testimony in the Greek, what it means is, is evidence given. And so we could, we could also say the proof of. They, they overcame him by the proof of their salvation or their, their testimony. So let me ask you a question. What is your testimony? Right now, if, give your testimony. What is your testimony? And I'll give you a minute to think about it, okay? You got your answer? Most of us would have this story. You know, this is what happened to me and this is how I felt and I remember that day and so forth and so on and all that's well and good. But your testimony needs to be the word of God. Your testimony needs to be the word of God. Now, if you would turn to Joshua chapter one, I, I want you to see something. This has been a a strong passage for me for years, Joshua chapter one. And you need to read the whole book of Joshua, but, but in particular verses one through six, Moses has died. God has called Joshua to take Moses' place and to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And he tells them in verse five, he says, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. But what's so powerful is verses six through nine. And listen to what God tells Joshua. He says, so be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Do you see what God told Joshua? Joshua's answer to everything was to be found in the word of God, to be found in the books that Moses had written and left him. And Joshua was to meditate on those books day and night. He was to, to not take his eyes off of those words that God had given him, not look to the left or the right. The purpose was, is that, Joshua was not to look at the battles in front of him. What he was to look at was God's word and the promises that God had given him. And then when somebody came and said, Joshua, what are we going to do about this, about Jericho? Joshua was not to give a testimony, you know, well, I remember way back when, and, and, and this is how I felt, and this is what, no, no. Joshua's testimony was the word of God. And God's word said that I will give you this land and there will not be an enemy that will be able to stand up before you. And because that was Joshua's testimony and because when they came and when they said, Joshua, but what are we going to do about Jericho? Look at those walls. Joshua, Joshua, I'm not looking at the walls. Look at, look at Jericho's defenses. We can't. Joshua said, I'm not looking at Jericho. The word of God. 
the promises of God is my testimony, and God will give us the victory. And you know the story. God gave them the victory, and it was in the most unusual way that, that could have been imagined to march around the city for six days in total silence and then on the seventh day do it again seven times and blow a trumpet? That's how you're going to fight a battle? Yes, sir, because my testimony is the word of God. You see, here's what happens. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, he says, for you have been born again. How did you get saved? He said, you have been born again. How did you get saved? He said, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. How did you get saved? Through the word of God. You see, that's our problem. I know there are many ways to explain salvation. We, we can say, it, I, I've been saved by faith. The grace of God, it was a gift of grace. I believed the gospel and so forth and so on. But what it boils down to is exactly what Peter said. You were born again because you heard the word of God. And that word became a seed in your spirit and it grew and it bore fruit of repentance and faith so that when God drew you to himself, you could respond in faith. You were saved by the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let me illustrate this and, and maybe help you to understand it better by by doing it this way. Let me give you my testimony. When people ask me, how do you know you're saved? How can you be so sure that you're saved? How, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because God said so. That's my testimony. Because God said so. Jesus died on the cross according to the scriptures. And he said in John 3, 16, that he loved me so much that he, he died on the cross that whosoever, me, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's my testimony. My testimony is Romans 10, verse 9, that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. People say, well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because God said so. Because Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you that you may be with me. Because God said so. It's not because of me. It's not because of anything I've done, and it's not because of anything that's happening in this world right now today. It's because of God's word. And my testimony, when Satan comes against me, when Satan accuses me, when Satan reminds me of, of things that I've done in the past, my testimony is the word of God. Satan, He'll say, don't you remember what you did? God could never forgive somebody that did something like that. And I say, Satan, on the cross, Jesus Christ paid for my sin. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's your testimony. The word of God. My salvation is only as good as God and his word. The only thing that can stop my salvation from coming to completion, the only thing that can stop me from being resurrected from the dead if I die in this life and don't live to the rapture, the only thing that can stop me from enjoying eternity in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, is if God and his word fail. 
That's my testimony. That's how I know. If the only testimony that you have is a feeling that you got at some point in your life or, or that you were baptized on such and such day or, or, or that you've been in church all your life and so you know you're a Christian, if, if that's the only testimony that you've got, how will that sustain you in a time of persecution? And how will that sustain you under the onslaught of Satan. No, Satan, you can't touch me. I've been baptized. Satan, you can't touch me. I'm a member of this church. Satan will rip that apart. The only thing that Satan fears is the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of God. And my testimony is the word of God. And it needs to be yours too. That was their testimony, was the word of God. And then notice what he says. Number three, the last thing, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony. And then he says, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And this is another problem that we in the modern age today and in the church today have, and that's death. We don't want to die. We want to live in this world. We enjoy the world, and we wind up, <laughs> as I talked about the other night, Lot's wife. Remember, she couldn't separate herself from the world, but these people did. And that's what gave them the victory. They knew they were saved, and they knew how they got saved. The word of their testimony was the word of God and nothing else, and they weren't afraid to die mainly because of the promise of the resurrection and eternal life in Jesus Christ, but also because they had already died once to the world and to their selves. Now think about that. That's what scripture tells us. Jesus says that, that anyone who would, who would save his life, he'll lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake will gain it or save it. These people had already died to the world. They had already died to self and they said, I give myself to Jesus Christ. Now, remember, this is in the tribulation period, okay? So when these people accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they are signing their death certificate. And they're doing that by rejecting the mark of the Antichrist. They know because they've seen it all around them. Anyone who rejects the mark of the beast, what happens to them? They're killed. They're hunted down and they're killed. So these people, when they accept Jesus Christ, they're actually saying two things. They're saying, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, and I'm ready to die because they are going to be hunted down and die. And folks, that's what Jesus means when he says, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple to take up your cross means that I am dead to this world. And so even if this world kills my body, it is of no consequence because all that means for me is eternal life in heaven. And folks, that's how they overcame Satan. Remember, Jesus said, don't, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. He said, rather be afraid of the one that can kill the soul, destroy the soul in hell. If you're ready to give your body, if you're ready to take up your cross for Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. Nothing. Now, having said all that, and if you're paying attention and, and you know your scripture, then you've probably got a question right here. And that question right here is that, well, Brother Don, you're telling us that, that they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony. They love not their lives unto death, but yet Satan kills them. Well, 
Yeah. And that is how they overcame him. And that's part of what infuriates Satan is because God's people, remember Satan is the prince of the power of the air, this world. Paul says he is the God of this world. And when God's people die to this world and turn their back on the things of this world, when God's people aren't controlled by the things of this world anymore, the pride of life, the, the love. Remember what John says in, in 1 John, the, the, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the, the things of the eye. When you die to that, you have, you have slapped Satan in the face. Because it's this world that Satan uses to keep people from God. Again, Lot's wife. She was, she was making an effort. She was headed in the right direction. But she couldn't separate herself from the world. And when these people were willing to lay down their life and die, that they, they, they were slapping Satan in the face they had overcome him. Our problem today is we're not willing. We are not willing. We're too tied to the world. We're more concerned about what's going on in the world, what's going to happen in the stock market, what's going to happen in the United States. And, and I'm upset about the United States too. It breaks my heart to see such a great country being destroyed. But folks, that's not our concern. We are children of God. We are children of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. We have to die to this world. That's how they overcame Satan, and that's how they will overcome Satan in the tribulation period, and that is how we will overcome Satan today, in our day. And if we're going to have victory of any kind in our lives today, it is going to be just like they did in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Amen? I trust that you'll meditate on this passage and that you'll come to understand what Jesus asks of us. Yes, he, he, just, he wants to save us and keep us from going to hell, but there is so much more when you give yourself to Christ and die to everything else and live for Christ. Amen. God bless you and thank you for being with me tonight. And I hope, uh, I hope this has been a blessing to you and share it with your friends. And uh, if you uh, watch this on Facebook or, or, or YouTube, if you have a question, if you have a comment, just put them in the, uh, in the comments down there. And, and uh, if you have a question, I, I'll answer it as best I can. It may take me a little while to study and figure it out, but I'll work on it and, uh, and I'll answer it. If you have a prayer request, if there's something you want me to pray with you about, uh, just shoot me a message, email don.chumley at gmail.com, and uh, it'll just be between you and me. It won't go out over the internet. It won't go on a prayer list. It'll just be between you and me, and, and we'll just pray together. And uh, if, if there's uh, anything you need, let me know, and, and we will get through this time that we're living in. God bless you, and thank you.